Welcome to the Experience Lab. I'm Sonia Rhodes, founder and CEO, and along with our entire team of Catalyst, we extend massive gratitude for all that you and your teams are doing to lead the way at this challenging time. The Experience Lab is an incubator of ideas and an accelerator for action, partnering with visionary healthcare systems in the exploration and design of a more human healthcare experience for team members, providers, patients, and their loved ones, helping them lead, look, live, and love their way to a new future for healthcare. We know how busy you all are right now and are so delighted that you've joined us for today's Experience Salon. If you're anything like me, I feel like most days I need to really pay attention to the need for a deep breath, and I thought perhaps we could just collectively take that deep breath in through the nose and out through the mouth so that we may begin. As our reflection, let's begin with the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said, all life is an experiment. The more experiments you make, the better. Today, we will explore the power of experimentation with one of the greatest leadership thinkers of our time. Margaret Heffernan, guest faculty in the Experience Lab, is an executive, author, entrepreneur, and provocateur. And her soon-to-be-released book, Uncharted, reveals the kind of fresh thinking needed in times of uncertainty. It is my distinct honor to welcome, all the way from the UK, the extraordinary Margaret Heffernan. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you, Sonia, and thank you to everybody who's uh, taken the time out to join today. I know you're all incredibly busy, so I'm going to try to pack in quite a lot, which I hope will give you food for thought over the coming days and weeks. So there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, the world changing so fast, and is it, you know, are we doing things faster than ever before, and is the rate of change faster than ever before? And I think it's the wrong question. I think we have an experience of incredible change because we're working with a mental model of time that actually doesn't work very well for us. Most institutions grow up to plan things and management has, I tend to think of as a sort of three-legged stool. And the three legs of the stool are forecast, plan, execute. And there's a problem with this three-legged stool because one of the legs has fallen off. And that's the forecasting leg. Experts in forecasting say we now, if you're fantastically good at forecasting, the furthest out you can see is maybe 400 days. For the rest of us, maybe 150 days. We've lost the ability to do long-term forecasting because the world has over the last 20 to 30 years moved from something that was relatively complicated to something that is now largely complex and the two aren't the same. What is complicated is are things, activities, processes that repeat themselves regularly. They're very subject to efficiency, they're linear. We can take them apart and maximize them for efficiency. And there are things in our lives that are like that. If you go to the airport and check in your bag, that is a complicated process. There are lots of moving parts, but they're always the same. So we can plan that with minute attention to detail, get it better and better and better and better until we've really got it just right. But then there's a lot in that experience from putting your suitcase on the airplane to being on the airplane yourself that changes in subtle ways we don't always recognize. We move from a complicated environment to a complex environment because once you're up in the air, you can't be sure exactly what's going to happen. You know that small changes could have a huge impact on the plane and all the people in it. You know that in the moment of that change, Expertise may not be quite enough because you may not have exactly the knowledge or the experience that you need. And so in complex environments, what you have is a situation where there's a, there may be patterns, but they don't repeat themselves regularly. And so you never quite know exactly on this day, what kind of expertise am I going to need? 
In complex environments, therefore, you can't afford to be efficient. You need to have more skill, more talent, more resources than you could possibly anticipate. And again, you know, using the flying analogy, this is, can be quite clear, which is in, when people design airplanes, they put in four engines, which are more than they need. The four engines run off of multiple operating systems. Both of these things are not efficient, they're expensive, but they're designed that way to be robust. So if there's a bug in the operating system, the fact that one operating system is faulty means the other ones can keep going. You're not dependent on a single operating system. Likewise, the engines, if one engine is faulty, the others will keep the plane in the air. You can never be entirely sure what you're going to meet up there. And therefore this system of flying is over-engineered to allow the capacity to respond in the case of the unexpected. So these two environments, the complicated and the complex, are quite different and they require really different skills and really approach it and, and different approaches. And I think that to a large degree, we have all grown up thinking, well, the world is complicated. We can forecast, plan, execute. We do it better and better and better. And that will resolve all the situations in which we find ourselves. And increasingly, we find that that's no longer true, that the complex keeps coming at us things that are unexpected, for which we're unprepared. And if we run organizations that are too efficient, we don't have the capacity and the robustness we need for the quality of response that we, we require. So what does that mean in kind of when you take that out of the abstract and you take it into daily life? I think it means two things, at least. The first is that we have to get quite sharp at identifying the difference between when we're dealing with something that's complicated and we're dealing with something that's complex. We have to ask ourselves the question, what kind of problem is this? Because if you try to deal with a complicated problem as though it's complex, you'll waste tons of time and energy and money and effort. But if you deal with a complex problem as though it's complicated, you will deprive yourself of any safety net, any flexibility, any adaptability, which is one of the issues that I think in healthcare systems around the world we're seeing, which is having managed everything for maximum efficiency when something unexpected comes at us. We scrabble around because lots of the things, the capacities, the objects, the resources, the infrastructure we need, well, we strip that all out thinking we were running a predictable, complicated system. So what do we need to do? I wanna to talk today just about kind of two different approaches to this. The first is around experiments. The thing about a complex, a complex condition is that if you're, it's, you can't see all of its qualities at once. It's like there's too much to see, there's too much going on, it's non-linear, you can't really follow the plot. So what you do in that situation is you can create experiments to see, well, is there some opportunity here? Is there something we could do differently that might give us extra capacity? And I'll just give one example here, which is a Dutch healthcare system. Uh, in the Netherlands, a huge amount of healthcare is done at home. It's understood, as I'm sure you all know, on the whole patients get much better at home. So the Dutch government mandates that a lot of care is done at home. And it used to be done as a complicated system. Every patient had a contract for X hours per day for a certain period of time. A huge bureaucracy lay behind this. Every contract was barcoded. Every nurse's schedule was, was barcoded. It had a huge amount of machinery behind it. It was laborious to work and nurses absolutely hated it. They felt their patients were being tre treated like apples that were picked and boxed and shipped off. So the Dutch, uh, a Dutch nurse who was also an economist said, hang on, this system is complicated and it's complex. The complicated bit is getting the contracts in place and assigning the nurses to the patients. We can automate a lot of that and use technology to really slimline it. The complex part is the patient 
because even with the same conditions, patients all respond differently. Some recover really quickly. Some have to go back into hospital. This part is inherently unpredictable. So we shouldn't treat this as though it were a single process. It's in fact two processes. So the first complicated part, let's make that as efficient as we can. And the second part, which is unpredictable, let's trust to human judgment and professionalism. So the experiment was, let's take 10 nurses, let's give them 40 patients, and let's see what happens if we say to the nurses, do the right thing. That's it. No more instructions, no time limits, no schedules, no nothing. Just do the right thing. The experiment was remarkable because what happened is the patients got better in half the time. The cost of the system fell by 30%. And it also had additional uh, benefits, which it meant lots of patients didn't go back into hospitals and the savings were immense. When I asked, the nurse stroke economist, Joost de Bloch, um, what had surprised him about his experiment. He burst out laughing and said, I had no idea it would be so easy. And I had no idea that the savings and the benefits would be so enormous. These are not the kinds of insights you gain through planning. They're not the kinds of insights you gain when planning resides in finance. They're experiments that provide learning about how your complex system really operates, which you can only uncover by doing the experiment. Now, not all experiments, of course, are as triumphant as yours to blocks. But the point is that in organizations which have a combination, a really tricky combination of the complicated and the complex, separating the two out and doing experiments to redesign how those two pieces work together, can yield extraordinary surprises and rewards. The additional thing about experiments is they give people hope, which is it makes them feel that there is scope for huge change in imagination instead of just kind of incremental refinements and efficiencies. So I think there's always a huge question to be asked, which is where do we find this kind of friction between the complicated and the complex? And what kind of experiments could we design? Not huge, you know, multi-year transformation programs, but quick experiments to learn, is there an opportunity to do something very much better here? The other thing which I think is important is to think about preparedness as opposed to planning. And the way I came at this was I went several years ago and talked to a man named Richard Hatchett. Richard's an American, he's moved to the UK to head up a new organization called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness. And it sprang from a recognition that epidemics are intrinsically complex events because we know that they are generally certain we will always have epidemics, we always have, but they're specifically ambiguous, which is to say we don't know where the next epidemic will break out, we don't know when it will break out, and we don't know what the disease will be. So the question that led to the founding of the coalition was, what could we put in place for epidemics that when one breaks out, we will wish that that infrastructure were there? Fantastic, fantastic question. And what Hatchet came to understand, which I think was a really brilliant insight, was that in epidemics too, there's this separation of the complicated and the complex. But he thought about it slightly differently. He thought about just in case, and just in time. So, for example, he thought, in case there's an epidemic, what do we need? And he decided basically there are two things you need when an epidemic breaks out. The first is vaccines. They're the holy grail and the silver bullet of epidemics. And the other is you need deep established networks of trust and reciprocity 
between epidemic emergency folk and the on the ground healthcare system. Or as Hatchett put it, you do not want to be exchanging business cards in the middle of a crisis. So you need to establish relationships with all of those places where epidemic could break out with people who will be on the ground meeting emergency responders. Now, what he did was he started all kinds of huge R&D projects, developing vaccines for potential epidemics that were most likely to occur. We are very lucky that among the group of diseases he chose to tackle first were beta coronaviruses. So we already have a substantial lead time in terms of thinking about this extremely difficult scientific problem. But he didn't do it only for beta coronaviruses. He did it for Nipah, he did it for Lassa, he did it for Rift Valley fever and many others, other particularly deadly and particularly likely diseases. These are just in case vaccines because some of them aren't gonna work. It's gonna look inefficient, but developing successful vaccines is intensely difficult. And some of them may sit on the shelf for years because that particular disease doesn't erupt anywhere for years. So it may look wasteful, but it's the only way to have what you need when the time comes. So just in case accepts complexity, it com accepts the unpredictability of events and says, never mind, because time is going to be of the essence always in an epidemic, we start before we have to. Equally, the coalition started building networks of healthcare professional, emergency responders, epidemic specialists, so that when the epidemic strikes, people already know people. They understand the social mores, the geographical conditions, the social conditions that make epidemic responsiveness successful or catastrophic. Again, some of these networks may never be used. You may have a fantastic bunch of relationships that you invested a lot of time in, in a country that doesn't see an epidemic for 10 years. Again, it looks really inefficient, but the minute the epidemic strikes, that is exactly what you need and you can't build it overnight. This is just in case thinking. But then he also recognized that once you have the networks and you have the vaccine, what you need to do, of course, is manufacture it at high quality, very, very fast, with speed that pharmaceutical companies typically don't care about and don't engineer for. And that's where you start thinking about just in time. So again, the coalition has set up relationships, contractual relationships, not just with manufacturers, but with sources of global capital to ensure that when the moment comes that there is a vaccine, you have the capital, you have the relationships, you have the contracts, you have the IP all in place and you can switch it on. Because manufacturing a drug is a complicated process. It's not a complex process. What you want at that point is maximum efficiency. So this, I think, becomes a very interesting construct with, through which to start seeing a great deal of the ambiguity and the uncertainty that is intrinsic to healthcare, which is the capacity to see that we have these two different qualities within all of our work, some aspects of which are really complicated, some very, very complex, ambiguous, and uncertain. And we can't approach, the, we can't approach them with identical uh, tools, mindsets, and procedures. In other words, we're trying to deal with the inherent unpredictability of life in a way that's better and gives us more robustness than just sitting back and hoping it won't happen, whatever it is. The other thing I'd like to say in this context is um, one of the things I researched in my book was also what I think of as fundamentally existential crises. This is when organizations or communities are confronting a really lethal threat. I studied a large number of companies and talked to their CEOs who had fought through sometimes years 
in an attempt to keep their organization alive, in an, in an attempt to keep certain qualities and products and capabilities alive. And these were absolutely unforgettable conversations. And they were very different from the hundreds, maybe thousands of interviews I've ever done with chief executives. Um, I would say that every CEO I interviewed relished the conversation. There was clearly something very deep and meaningful about the experience that um, went deep inside of them. And I also couldn't help but notice that at some point in all of these interviews, every single one of these CEOs, all men, every single one of them cried. That that's how deep the experience still was, even though they had all survived and their institutions had survived. And this was so striking and the, the emotional quality of these conversations was so remarkable that of course I had to ask each of them, what is it that got you through this? I mean, clearly, if this is so painful to remember now, I can't even begin to imagine what it was like then. What on earth got you through this month after month? And every single one of them said the same thing to me. They said, oh, it was my colleagues and my friends. You know, we didn't get through it because our jobs depended on it or we were incentivized to get through it. We got through it for each other. When one of us couldn't take it anymore, you know, someone stepped in and carried us. But we had these relationships with our colleagues, with our peers, with our workforce, that actually what kept us going was each other. And one of them added rather bitterly or sadly, I think, you know, it really was the opposite of the gig economy. And it really made me think that as we all get, you know, very entranced by our technological capabilities, our abilities to use, you know, AI to generate amazing findings and our ability to use technology to do so many things, including what we're doing today, it's very easy to get mesmerized by the machinery that we design and forget that actually, ultimately, what brings people to do exceptionally hard work, exceptionally creative and innovative work, is only their joy and delight in discovering things with each other and for each other. And however much we may be dazzled by the technology of prediction, actually our ultimate resource of and source of robustness is each other. And I don't think that has ever been more true, at least in my lifetime, than the crisis that we're going through right now, which is going to be hard. It's not going to be over by Easter. It's going to be taxing and demanding of all of us, emotionally, intellectually, physically. And what will get us through it is our capacity to think and our desire to think because of the way that we feel about each other and the society that we serve. The world is inherently unpredictable in much that it throws at us. And I don't believe for a moment that the answer is, well, let's just get better at prediction. I think the real deep answer is, Let's be robust in our response. Let's be robust in our capacity to think about it, to experiment, to learn, and to support each other through that learning. Thank you. Margaret, um, I am mesmerized by all that you shared. Every conversation we've had have been so timely, so prescient, so needed right now. Um, I know we're looking at questions here. I had a couple come in on text, so they're coming in in a variety of different ways from colleagues across the industry, across the country, across the globe. Um, one I think that I'd like to begin with, as others may be formulating a question for you, every day we're talking with healthcare executives and we're hearing that they've made more change 
in a shorter period of time in the entire span of their career. Things that used to take months and sometimes years are taking minutes, hours, or 24 hours. And, and one of these executives had, had sent in saying, you know, we're, we're changing the way that we're working forever. How do we now make sure we tap into that new wisdom, that new capacity to, to robustly handle these things quickly and make sure that we uh, bring that forward into the way that we work into the future? Any thoughts on that? Sure. I mean, I think there, there are sort of two parts of this. I think um, there's always a kind of big adrenaline rush in a crisis because you have a mandate to do things fast and furiously in a way that's often quite elusive in kind of more mundane times. And so people get quite excited, you know, they can do a lot. Um, I, I'm a little wary of them in some contexts. One reason is in a crisis, most organizations revert to command and control. I don't think that's going to be sustainable long term in a complex environment because it doesn't draw on enough people or enough expertise. So I think it may be a good short term response, but it may not be something that you actually do want to hang on to forever. I would also say that in the huge changes that we're seeing almost every organization make at the moment, there will be good stuff and bad stuff. So, um, you know, our ability to do what we've done today, I think is fantastic. You know, I think it's absolutely wonderful. Um, but I've also spent some of today earlier um, in a board meeting where I observed that a subject came up, which is actually intrinsically quite contentious. It's a, it involves quite a lot of complex thinking about um, purpose and the ethics of an organization. And no real discussion was had. That actually, it's hard enough in most boards to have what I think of as constructive conflict. I would say within the context of Zoom, however wonderful it is, um, it's almost impossible to have constructive conflict. People are too tentative. Um, it's, you know, people are uncomfortable about kind of who's reacting how, you can't keep your eye on everybody, you can't sense the room. And I thought, and so, so on the whole, what happens is silence equals approval. And so we move from a contentious subject to an approval of a really pretty lackluster recommendation, which was essentially, well, let's leave it for now. And I think, you know, when we come out of this crisis, that stuff that got left for now, that list is going to be really long and you know what's going to happen? Nobody's going to look at it. And, you know, and as you know, from much of my earlier work, you know, conflict aversion is why we often become willfully blind to the things we most need to pay attention to. So I think it's naive to think that all the change that comes out of this crisis will be positive. And we have to keep a really good critical instincts tuned for this stuff is great. That stuff, actually, it's not so great. When we get back to being able to see each other, that's exactly when we got to see each other. So I think, you know, we have to keep our critical senses on and not get, you know, not get sucked into the tunnel vision that typically accompanies crises. Fantastic. Super helpful. Um, I love that. I know everyone's thinking a lot about that. A couple of new questions coming in. One, um, specific to these unique times, how do we find balance now in keeping our teams engaged with the work that they do and at the same time changing um, and reinventing our clinical processes to meet the needs and demands of our patients? So um, how do we find balance with keeping our teams engaged with the work that they do and at the same time um, you know, change and reinvent those clinical processes to meet the needs and demands. Yeah. Um, I think in a, in a crisis of the kind that we're in, I think balance is going to be exceptionally difficult. I mean, it's almost in the nature of a crisis that it's unbalanced, right? And when you think of the demands that are going to be placed on all healthcare systems, you know, um, it's not going to be very balanced. I think, again, this is where relationships become essential. You know, are people watching each other's backs? Is someone going to say to you, you know, Sonia, you have got to go home now. Because if you don't, you're a danger to yourself and you're a danger to other people. Um, 
is somebody going to say, actually, we need to give this subject a rest because it's not, it's not the most germane problem. So I think this issue, I think the issue of balance and covering each other's backs, I think this has to be perceived as a really shared responsibility. There can't be any one person who's in charge of this. We've all got to look out after each other. I mean, I have my in-laws living next door to me. My father-in-law's blood pressure is going through the roof. He's not my father, you know, but we're all looking after him because, well, that's what you do. Um, the other thing that I would say is very important not to think about um, looking after people hierarchically. You can look after the people you're in the room with, right? It's not about who's, who is whose manager. Um, very important to give yourself and your coworkers time to um, unpack. You know, leave the hospital, leave the clinic, go and have a beer, go for a walk, vent. Um, think hard about how much of this you have to take home because it's helpful sometimes to have a home where all the pressures on you are not, right? No true escape hatch. And it's tricky because of course, everyone's family is involved in this too. But, um, you know, to some degree, try to build some boundary around your work if you possibly can. And, you know, for my, for my money, the single best medicine in any situation in life is being able to sleep. And if you can sleep, you can think. And actually, if you can't sleep, you can't think, which is when people become really dangerous to each other. So, um, you know, get some fresh air. As you said at the beginning, Sonia, breathe, go for a walk, have a drink with a friend. Think about something else. Think about, you know, read a book that isn't about medicine. Um, see a crazy movie but um, give your brain a chance to do the work it magnificently does, which is to organize all the experiences you're having so that they become uh, manageable. Fantastic. I've got two more questions. We'll see if we can get to and, and then wrap here and be, being respectful of yours and everyone else's time. One is really an add on to that conversation that we were just having about relationship uh, versus hierarchy. Um, the idea coming out from Enrico is that the idea of identifying complicated versus complex challenges. And he's interested in knowing what your view on having several quarterbacks in a crisis would be, so uh, such as several leaders on different command centers working separately. Could it complicate an already complex problem, or is it more necessary to divide and conquer or divide and succeed? Well, it's interesting because I suspect you're going to find that that emerges um, organically anyway. You know, that different teams working with the same problem will come up with different initiatives or approaches that are different. And the important thing there is to share them because nobody's ever been here before. There is no roadmap. So we need to collect and share as much evidence as humanly possible. And the danger is that because everybody's in a hurry, because this is an emergency, which is I just, you know, hone my thing and you hone your thing. And we never put our heads together and say, actually, this is a fantastic shortcut, shortcut or this works really well. And so it's important to think about, you know, are we learning together enough or are we so focused, focused, focused that we're only learning from our own experience. And even if it's only five minutes, you know, what did you do today that really worked? What did you do today that you really don't ever want to do again? You know, and that kind of debrief at the end of the day is essential because that's where a lot of new ideas are generated. And again, one of the big dangers in a crisis is everybody reverts to what they already know. But we're in a situation that we don't know. So we need to be learning as fast as we can. And the best way to learn fast is together. I love that the best way to learn fast is together. How fantastic. One last question, if we can, and then we will close from Tom. Um, he said, today, most are focused on the crisis. 
at hand. How do we prepare for the 12, 18, 24 months out that today may also dramatically impact? So how do we look at today and ensure that we do not miss the big near-term shifts? It's interesting because I was talking to a colleague about exactly that earlier today. And I think um, there are a couple of pieces to this. I think it's really important as far as you can to write down your thoughts as you go along because you think you'll never forget them and you will forget them. Um, everybody will forget the pain because that's what our brain does rather brilliantly is forget pain. Um, but with the pain goes the insights. So the thoughts you have, write them down. But I would say it's too early to think about 18, 24 months from now. And the reason is this, and it's a painful thing to talk about, but this crisis is going to change everybody. And it's going to change everybody because everybody's gonna know somebody who died and how they died and whether they died well or whether they died badly. This isn't an economic crisis or a management crisis, right? This is a human crisis and it's going to change the people in it. And we don't know what we're going to want that's different when we come out of it. And prejudging that will mean we lose some of the wisdom to be gained from it. So I would say keep track of your thoughts, keep track of your ideas, but the present is going to be demanding enough. You know, I once had the opportunity years ago to go and speak at a conference that was held in Bretton Woods. And Bretton Woods is where in 1944, everybody came together to create the new economic world order. And it's an astounding, really moving place to think of you know, all these economists sitting around in the middle of a war, thinking about the future. And brave, and you know, John Maynard Keynes tearing up you know, staircases because there's only one elevator in the whole gigantic building, you know, and he was already ill. And just the effort they made to ensure that the world that came after the war would be better. But he wasn't doing that in 1940. He was doing it in 1944, after there was a lot of experience of what they'd gone through and what they needed the future to look like. So I'd say don't start too early but also don't start too late because you want to capture your feelings about what you've been through and the learning of what you've been through while it's still relatively raw. And the last thing I'd say is this crisis is not an economic crisis. It's easy for people to package it like that because then they can say, well, it's just like the banking crisis and we got through that, so it'll all be okay. This is not the banking crisis. It's a completely different beast. Trying to experience life through analogy is a really impoverishing thing to do. Be where you are, absorb the learning, write it down so that you don't forget. And as the, you, know, you get just a hint of daylight at the end of this tunnel, go back to it and think, okay, the house burned down. I don't want to build the old house. I want to build a dream house. Now, what does that look like? Uh, a perfect way for us to, to end our conversation and salon. Uh, so much for us to think about and so much for us to share back out as a result of this conversation with the industry and the world. Margaret, thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your timely wisdom. I know for me, it's a solace to have someone uh, help guide us through this kind of big thinking. Um, for everyone here, I do want you to know, um, it's as if Margaret had a crystal ball with her new book and a final chapter called Be Prepared on Epidemics. That book uh, is going uh, to be coming out in the US toward the end of summer and is already available for pre-order. I want to thank all of you for making time for Big Thinking today. A special thank you to Margaret for sharing your brilliance with all of us. 
we every day send you off um, with massive gratitude and mad love. And thank you so much for the work you're doing to heal healthcare and humanity. And we do hope to see you soon. Thank you all.